Okay. Well, for those who end up watching the recording, welcome. It's uh, Wednesday, September 29th. We're going to be chatting about uh, the Ferndale City Strategic Plan and the Master Land Use Plan, which um, also includes the Parks and Rec Plan. Um, those are currently under revision, um, or we're kicking off the revision process. Um, Justin's going to talk more about that, and we'll also be uh, uh, creating our first ever climate action plan. Um, so for tonight, what we're really going to do is just sort of give some background and context to these documents. Um, what are they fundamentally? Why do they exist? How are they used? Um, where can you find them? Um, I thought this might be helpful for folks because sometimes these documents, often these documents are referenced in um, uh, memos that are attached to city council agendas, um, in our discussions at city council meetings. Um, they're often referenced in um, planning commission meetings. Um, so to the extent that uh, residents watch those meetings or participate in them, you might have heard um, some of these documents referenced before, but might not have a lot of experience with what they are or how they came to be or how they're used regularly. Um, so that's really what today is. Um, just to sort of get some background information and cue ourselves up for the revision process that's kicking off for the master land use plan. Um, so we'll also be talking a little bit about what some of those public engagement opportunities are going to be in the upcoming months. Um, so I, uh, I'm Council Member Kat Bruner james um, I am your host tonight. Um, I'll be doing a little bit of the talking, but for the most part, I'm going to lean heavily on our city manager, um, Joe Gaucho, and also our planning director, uh, Justin Lyons. They'll be doing sort of the lion's share of the discussion and presentation. We'll try to keep our portion relatively limited to maybe 30 minutes-ish, um, and then open up the floor to some conversation. Um, we're probably not going to dive super deeply into the contents of these documents. I know that the land use plan itself is something like 160 pages, so we're probably not going to go into great detail, um, but we're going to give you the tools um, to help you read it and understand it a little bit more so that you can be better prepared um, for this revision process. So with that as our introduction and starting point, uh, welcome to those of you who have logged on live. Um, I hope that you can stick around for a bit. I know some folks have to go, um, but for those who uh, do have to leave early or weren't able to attend live, this is being recorded and we will um, share it hopefully for those who are interested. So, Justin or Joe, which one of you want to sort of start off with some of the fundamentals? Well, why don't <clears throat> we always begin with with uh, introductions? So, uh, first, I'll introduce myself. My name is Joe Gacho. I'm the city manager for Ferndale. I've been with Ferndale since uh, at the tail end of 2011, so just about 10 years. Uh, this this holiday season will be my 10th year, which is crazy. Um, and then Justin, why don't you introduce yourself? Sure. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining us this evening. I'm Justin Lyons, planning manager for the city. So I work on planning and zoning and mobility projects for the city. Um, I've been with the city essentially since 2016. So right around, I started right around when we did the last master plan. So um, that was a great introduction for me, um, you know, to get familiar with the community and the overall um, process. So excited to have a little bit of history from that, uh, as well as this new process. Kara, do you want to go next? Hi, uh, this is Kara Sokol. I'm the communications director for the city. Um, I'm <clears throat> hoping to uh, lend support to the MLUP process. 
um, by making sure that communications happen in all different audiences and groups. And so I'm excited to hear what um, conversations and questions we have tonight. Thank you, Councilwoman. Um, Kyle, why don't you introduce yourself too? Uh, good evening. I'm Kyle Paulette, the Assistant City Manager. And similar to Joe, I am uh, concerned about the strategic initiatives out of the LOUB, the Climate Action Plan, the Parks and Rec Plan, and uh, what excites me about this process is that it gives staff a blueprint from the community for us to go out and enact the change that they want to see. So I'm uh, very excited that we're uh, knee deep in this planning uh, so far. And we've got three participants um, on the line. If, if you're able to unmute yourselves, why don't you guys go ahead and introduce yourselves as well so we know who we're chatting with live. You're in the first place. Hi, I'm Heidi, can you hear me? Okay, um, yeah, so I'm Heidi and I've um, been a Ferndale resident for 13 years now and um, was um, interested in this. I, I got an email from someone. I'm on the, I was in the, I'm in the Ferndale Inclusion Network and um, I have a kid in the Ferndale Schools. I'm on the Ferndale Diversity Committee and um, I'm uh, part of the Ferndale Area Democrats. And so I keep getting emails about this and um, for various reasons, I think everyone, a lot of people are are interested in this. Um, and so I'm just, I'm here to learn because I, I just, I think I need to know more about it. Thanks for joining us, Heidi. Mm -hmm. Nicole or Kim, do either of you want to jump in? I can go next. Hi, I'm Nicole Laduser Janowitz, and I serve on the Ferndale Environmental Sustainability Commission Committee. And uh, I'm going to be attending some facilitation training on this. And I thought I would uh, come today just to gather <clears throat> some information. Thanks. And I'm I'm Kim. I'm Kim. I've I've attended a number of planning things over the years. I've lived in Ferndale since the late '80s. Um, in our second residence here, um, I live in the Northwest Quadrant and like to be informed. Great. Well, welcome everyone. And we've also got another staff member who just jumped on, Jordan Porty. Um, have you been on long enough to uh, just unmute yourself and say hello, Jordan? Yes, indeed. Hey, Kat. Hey, everybody. Thanks for having me here. All right. Um, and so I already introduced myself. I'm uh, Cameron of James, council member. I will add um, to that introduction, though, that I did participate in the um, Master Land Use Plan Steering Committee the last time around um, in 2016, in 2017, because it kind of crossed the calendar year, if I remember correctly. Um, so I have probably a bit more functional knowledge of, uh, of the MLUP than, than a lot of folks, but there's always more to learn. So I'm, I'm here learning just as much as I am um, presenting. So. Um, with that, let's start talking sort of about what, what are these plans? Where do they come from? Why and how were they created? Um, Joe, you're unmuted, so do you want to go first? Yeah, it, well, I'll be very brief. I'll be Justin's warm-up act. Um, but I would like to say uh, in, in Ferndale as an organization, everything begins first with our, our city council strategic plan, which was adopted in 2016. And I'm just gonna share my screen. This is important for the public to understand um, because can everyone, can everyone see that screen? It's, uh, yep, now it's up. Okay. <clears throat> so this is a, a vision statement and a mission statement. And there was a series of values that were adopted in 2016, which was the first year uh, city council actually held a strategic retreat that resulted in a city council strategic plan where we defined seven key outcome areas that are factors for everything we do. And so from that 
retreat, we also concurrently held our five-year master land use plan. And the benefit of that is that all of the uh, key deliverables or improvement opportunities, investment opportunities, if you will, are all really policy and budget oriented. And by adopting the strategic plan, we adopted key uh, outcome factors that we wanted to focus around. And so um, these were those outcome factors that were adopted. And each one of these should speak to our vision statement, right? And so in order for us to be successful as a city and as a community, we must have economic prosperity. We must have a safe, protected and engaged community. We must support our infrastructure. We do support accessible transportation. Uh, we pursue strong regional, out, regional partnerships and collaboration. Uh, as an organization, we must strive for financial excellence. And, and we recognize the value of healthy, connected and invested neighborhoods. All of these are aspirational in nature, right? And, and through these aspirations, you see a lot of policy decisions being made, a lot of budget orientation being made. So everything we do really must and should align with our vision statement adopted by city council. And we should apply uh, our values to the work that we do, which are uh, lead with integrity, always focus on inclusiveness, seek to be inspirational and pursue innovation. And this past year, City Council actually added a fifth charge to that, which was the adoption of the city's anti-racism resolution, which has resulted in the incorporation of a racial equity uh, value that we've also added and in, in incorporated into our annual performance plans, also into our logic for doing what we do. And so I Could think- Could we that's also just, add a critical success? I'm sorry, yes. You yeah. did. I apologize. Yes. Yeah, so this is an this is an old slide. Uh, this is live on Ferndale.gov. If you want to see the the current strategic plan, it's on the homepage. If you just scroll down to the middle, in council, uh, this council that was elected in 2019 held a retreat update and added an eighth outcome factor uh, focused on climate resiliency, which again that's a salient point now. So when you hear us uh, bring uh, policy proposals or budget recommendations, you're going to notice what we bring forth is oriented towards sustainability or equity, uh, accessibility, and, and things of that nature. So really, I just like to leave with the strategic plan. It's pretty unique, and Ferndale is pretty unique in that everything we do uh, from the hiring process to the budget process is oriented around uh, principles and values and the pursuit of these aspirational outcomes. And with that, I will give the floor over to Justin as soon as I expand my screen. Give me one moment. Kyle, you might have to kick me out. My computer's freezing. <laughs> ah, there we go. Yeah. There you All go. All right. Sorry. No problem. Um... So hello again, Justin Lyons, planning manager for the city. So I will um, give you a little bit more background on specifically the master plan. So um, I don't think it's necessarily what, you know, Eric, Eric B and Rakim were referring to um, if you're an eighties rap fan, but um, <laughs> the master plan is essentially a, another policy document. So you can kind of think about it. I'll show it on another slide. You can kind of think about it as a, you know, sort of um, a, a connection directly to the master plan, uh, to the strategic plan and the other plans the city has. So I'll show you here um, shortly, but, but if I can just boil it down to um, one thing, I would say that this process is just starting. So you're joining at the perfect time and really this whole, you know, next month is all the starting process where we're really going out to engage folks. And so um, you can find all of the project documents as we build them and meeting notices and things like that on planferndale.com. And there's an area to sign up for a email list, which I think some of you may already be on. So thanks for signing up. Um, as well as um, opportunities where you can request that we come um, as staff and steering committee members and present to your neighborhood group or even give you the tools to get some feedback yourself. So more on that to come. But um, so as you can see here on this slide, um, the master land use plan, or we shorten it typically to master plan here in Ferndale, is, is something that's 
a policy document that's required by Michigan law. So in theory, every community in Michigan um, is required to do this sort of plan. Um, I don't know if there's the master plan police that come around from the state for communities that don't do it every five years, but um, we do stick with that recommended five-year time frame. And so you probably have heard the term zoning before and um, its connections to a master plan, but um, think about it as the master plan is, is, is policy that guides decision-making related to how land is used in a city and how um, the cities make improvements to uh, capital improvement plans um, and parks, city buildings, streets, uh, but also um, major developments in the city. Uh, so it's, it's more about guiding policy about land use, whereas zoning is an official law that usually comes after a master plan where it might say, you know, how tall a building can be or what um, building materials you can use if you're build, um, constructing a new development of some sort. So that is the, a very short version of the master land use plan or master plan. Um, and if you participated about five or six years ago, um, you know, we really focused on updating our master plan. And at the same time, we did the parks and recreation plan. A lot of communities do those at the same time because, you know, they both have to do with land use. They both have to do deal with what people want to see in their parks and in their communities. Um, and so there's really a lot of strategies and goals that come with both those plans. So it makes sense to do them at the same time. Um, and also um, parks and recreation plans help communities qualify for major grants um, like uh, the states, I forget what it's calling right now or called right now, but um, through the parks fund that, um, you know, you probably have heard our parks department staff talk about applying for a, um, for grants to the state. And a lot of those funds are that we are qualified for those funds because we have a plan like this that says, we've thought about this, we've talked to the community, here's what they wanna see in Gary Park, here's what they wanna see in Wilson Park. Um, so during the last plan, <clears throat> we did those plan, uh, or process, we did those plans at the same time. We also um, incorporated a lot of sustainability elements, um, not as like separate goals really as much, but more of um, interwoven throughout the plan, which I think was, Kind of innovative at the time, and I've you know seen other communities use that models. Um, this time, it, during this process, so we're saying we're going to take three plans and put them together um, as one, because really, if you think about it, um, a climate action plan, which is something new for I think a lot of Michigan communities, but done all over the country, it's a document that's also policy related that has strategies and actions to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, you know, focusing on mitigation, resiliency, adaptation to climate change. And so that ties directly to um, a lot of the um, success factors and one key success factor that Joe mentioned in the strategic plan, in the city council strategic plan. So um, this also builds upon, you may have heard that earlier this year, um, the city completed a greenhouse gas emissions study, which basically just analyzes all of like city buildings and street lights and things like that to get a baseline of, okay, how much um, are we contributing to greenhouse gas emissions? You know, how much um, energy is City Hall you know, using? Um, maybe because there are certain portions of it that don't have updated light bulbs and things like that. So it gets, it got pretty detailed, but it's good to set a baseline. And so really after you get, do it uh, inventory like that, it sets you up to, you know, figure out what strategies and actions we can do to reduce some of those emissions. Um, and so, you know, it just made sense to do all these plans, I think, together at once because they do all affect land use, right? Um, and so the goal is to have smart goals, clear metrics, and then equitable, sustainable outcomes is sort of the theme for this and, and, and through an inclusive process. So um, that's sort of a lot of information on one slide, but, but generally uh, with these types of plans, they're um, made with recommendations from the community. Um, with a review by the planning commission and other associated boards and commissions with all the input from the community that will be in these plans. And then city council adopts the final plan and we effectively use that going forward um, for implementing a lot of different actions and projects and park improvements and um, a whole host of things. Um, so a successful master plan process to me is in integrated and inclusive and has those clear goals um, and you know, make sure that we get as much uh, input from the community as possible. 
see if I can go to the next slide. Um, so there's a lot on this slide, which um, you know we can we can post in the Facebook um, event and and on the project page for the master plan. But um, you know, as I was saying, the heart of all these plans that we talk about is the Ferndale community. Uh, so Joe mentioned the City Council strategic plan. I talked about three other plans that we're building, but there's also other plans that, that have been worked on over the years. So um, there's an affordable housing plan that has a much longer name, but um, that was adopted, um, I believe, last year. Um, that has a lot of you know the elements of the strategic plan, but built from the community. We also earlier this year, City Council adopted a Ferndale Moves Mobility Plan that focuses on transportation, which you know obviously has a lot of connection to land use, but also climate action. When you think about um, how much greenhouse gas emissions. Um, are really set forth by transportation. So a very key part to that. So you can see that there's a lot of guiding principles with each of these plans. Um, you know, parks is focused on obviously parks, but the people and the programs that use those parks and you know participate in those programs. Um, climate action, obviously, you know, it is very much focused on reducing greenhouse gas emissions, um, but making sure that there's people-centered development, it, um, you know, is something that I think we've heard more and more from the community about get, wanting to be involved with development projects and how are those projects um, shaping the built environment and how land is used and, and you know a direct connection to climate there. Joe went, went through all of the um, guiding principles of the city council strategic plan, climate action, adaptation and um, community resiliency being the, the newest one that was added. Um, the last master plan kind of focused on these four so progressive, equitable, sustainable, and resilient. Um, you see those connections, as I mentioned, with the mobility plan. Um, and then the affordable housing plan to be a welcoming community and offer up other types of housing that is affordable uh, and make sure the city is leading those types of conversations because if it doesn't come from the city and the community, um, it, it, it may not happen. So um, encouraging diversity that ties um, to the uh, anti-racism policies that council passed as well. So. Um, you know, a lot of people say like these are the city's plans and things like that. They're the community's plans that have, you know, built in um, their guiding principles. So that's where all of this, uh, all these plans come from is built from the community out. Um, I sort of mentioned, you know, how these plans are currently organized and, you know, still revolving around the community. Um, but you can see, like I said, a lot of the ties together there. And so, um, we did this inventory of just how the plans are organized so that we know that with the master plan coming up now, you know, we, we take a look back. We want to look forward. We want to look back and say, you know, what did these, what did the Mount last master plan say? Do we want to keep some of those things? Do we want to change some of those things? So that's where a lot of the community engagement opportunities coming up will allow people to weigh in on those and weigh in on the guiding principles. Uh, but it, these plans cover everything from maintenance to um, economics to cities, uh, infrastructure, and then to public health and safety, um, and even food systems. So, um, you know, they, they are, they are, they cover quite a bit. Um, and, you know, I think city staff appreciates that we have, after these plans are adopted, we can go and implement a lot of these things because they came from the community. Um, so this is um, a postcard you may have seen in the community. We just started handing them out. They're available at city hall and things like that. And you'll see them more places, but really, exactly what I said earlier, there's a lot of opportunities to get involved ahead. This is the early stage in the process where we're setting up community engagement meetings. Um, so planferndale.com again is the website. Um, and really the next major community uh, meeting um, will be a two day summit that um, we're finalizing exactly what the schedule will be, but generally on October 26th and 27th, we're gonna hold three sessions focused on one on parks and recreation, um, one on land use, which, you know, again, sounds very boring, uh, but it is really not. Um, it does help set forth future guidelines for development, how they can be more equitable, more inclusive. How can we dig into the zoning ordinance and make sure any anti-racist policies that are part of that are removed? Um, just some of those are inherent by nature that a lot of communities are working on and changing right now. Um, and then of course, climate and resiliency. So, um, yeah, those will be three separate sessions that people can attend that'll be recorded, um, all likely through Zoom, um, just based on the size of what those groups probably will be, but um, more to come on that. And so 
Um, I would say definitely, you know, sign up for the mailing list, email list if you have not already, um, and keep checking the project page as we provide more information. So um, I probably said enough to kick us off, I think, uh, Councilwoman, but um, I just want to just press upon again, this is the, this is the time you have the power to make change, and we we aren't kidding. These aren't this isn't my plan. This is the community's plan, and so I'm mostly just the face you'll see shepherding the process. But um, I'm hoping to get to know more of you that maybe didn't participate last time. So yeah, and I I wanted to make sure that in this discussion we made sure to um, sort of highlight how to find these materials, and I think. Plan Ferndale, uh, is it planferndale.com? Yes. Okay, planferndale.com, I think is a really good starting place because if you scroll down, you can um, find links to the 2017 Ferndale Master Plan, the Parks and Recreation Plan, and reminder that we're creating our first climate action plan so we don't have a previous version. Um, for reference, it, there were elements woven into the previous master plan, but now there will be a separate plan with that emphasis. Um, and Joe, do you want to um, just reiterate where folks can find the strategic plan if that's what they're looking for? Yeah, uh, you'd log into Ferndale, not log in, go to ferndalemi.gov. <laughs> and if you scroll just about halfway down, Matter of fact, I can probably share my screen now that I've learned how to unshare. One moment, I'll show. Okay. <laughs> I struggle about some technology right now. There we can we see it. Get done. Okay. So, if you go to the homepage and scroll down, you'll see where we keep our main projects and initiatives. These are static. Uh, so you see, we wanna okay. always be communicating our key projects. You have your police transparency dashboard there. Okay. Uh, we have program-based budgeting there, city council strategic plan. And this is the, the current adopted master plan from uh, 2017. And if you click through, this is a, a document that's really gives you a dashboard and kind of how we're progressing and moving forward. Council's uh, strategic initiatives, again, you see our vision, mission, principles, and values. And for each one of these, you can click through and see what project staff is working on related to each of these uh, key success factors. Great, thank you for that additional um, visual. Um, before we turn it over for questions and discussion, I wanted to highlight just a few um, questions and topics that I wanted to make sure get covered. Um, one, now correct me if I'm wrong, but um, the, the, the land use plan in particular, um, is it true that basically um, the goals and objectives that are identified there, um, some of those are sort of dependent on um, budget and priorities. Is that is that fair or or is there an understanding that you know we'll just go through one by one and tick off the whole list? It's, it is definitely priority based and so um, that's definitely where we try to connect with strategic plan too and, and see what things align there. but um, but yeah, I think the last plan had 118 action items that, you know, we staff has been chipping away at since 2017, and it touches multiple departments. But um, you know, you'll see certain ones where you know community preferences and priorities have changed a little bit, budget priorities have changed a little bit. So some of those things didn't get implemented, but um, you can see how they could evolve to the to this next plan update. So that's why it's kind of nice. Um, I would say too is that the plans are updated typically every five years, and so you know. Uh, you're, you're looking out further past that to try and mm -hmm. um, influence land use and park improvements and stuff like that. But um, uh, you do have the ability to kind of reassess and say, okay, well, you know, it's been five years and maybe that doesn't make as much sense for our community. Okay. Um, 
All right, so we're just a little over 30 minutes in. It was my intent, even though we scheduled this for up to 90 minutes, um, to actually try to keep it a little bit closer to an hour, but give ourselves some buffer to spill over if we're having a vibrant and dynamic discussion. Um, so what I would suggest at this point is to give people the opportunity to unmute, chime in, ask a question, um, join the discussion. And um, just for those of you who joined a few minutes late, we did sort of go through and introduce ourselves, um, including those in attendance. So let's see, Dominic, Dave, and Lindsay, I suspect you're, you're the person behind the Surge account. If you guys want to jump in and introduce yourselves, we'd love to hear your voices if you can. Uh, ah, hello, it's Dave Cottrell. I just got here maybe at 7.15 and right now listening. I had seen um, some of this presentation at perhaps a city council meeting and um, of course I I just a uh, question about perhaps on the master planning about why our central business district is zoned for seven story buildings I don't think it really fits the small town of Ferndale at all it's more kind of like jamming a bunch of stuff in that doesn't belong and then I really don't like the R3 either which is making some neighborhoods like West Saratoga and West Willington uh, not very livable, but those are my concerns. Thanks, Dave. Um, why don't we give Dominic and Lindsay a chance to chime in and introduce themselves, and then we'll, we'll, we'll circle back to the things that you raised, Dave. Hi, this is Lindsay. Kat, you were exactly right. I am on my phone and didn't even realize what account I was signed into. So <laughs> thank you. My name is Lindsay Terhar. I'm a Ferndale citizen. Um, I also work with the Ferndale Inclusion Network and the Metro Detroit chapter of Showing Up for Racial Justice. Um, I'm glad to be here. Thanks, Lindsay. Uh, Dominic, do you want to Unmute and say hello if you're able to. We'll give you a second. You might be on a device where you can't or maybe you stepped away. We can always circle back. You're welcome to unmute at any time. Um, so, and then others can, um, can jump in with questions or concerns as well. Um, Justin, do you want to uh, say anything about Dave's questions about um, building up to seven stories in the downtown district and sort of, and he also touched on R3. Um, can you explain what R3 means or really what residential zoning terminology is for, for folks who aren't as familiar? Absolutely. So um, the city and, and you know I think most cities and in, in communities in Michigan do have um, a zoning ordinance and it, it, part of that is also a zoning map so I think Dave mentioned the central business district which is a zoning district um, and I can I'd be happy to pull up the zoning map too but um, and then the R3 district which is um, another zoning district that is single two family and multiple family residential so um, not to get too back in the history of zoning, but essentially, um, you know, in the early 20s, there were um, a lot of instances where you would have competing land uses right next to each other. You had would have a, you know, uh, pig production manufacturing, you know, yard next to a bunch of houses. And so um, I think the case was Euclid back in Ohio and uh, interesting for, for planning history, you know, purposes, because um, it did set a precedent and basically created zoning where people and communities can say where they would like to separate land uses. Um, zoning's evolved quite a bit since then, um, but um, the city I think has, you know, uh, at least 
15 different zoning districts, I think. Um, and, and so those are divided into different parts of uh, the city where, you know, there's some industrial areas and there's two different industrial zoning districts. There's a at least four residential zoning districts. And then like Dave mentioned, the central business district, that's actually divided into two. So there's um, a lot of interesting things to dig in there. And each of those zoning districts have uh, effectively laws that go with them related to building height, design, how close a building can be to the sidewalk or property line, um, parking requirements, and a whole host of other things, tree plantings and stuff like that. Um, and so I think that this more specific, so as I was saying earlier, the master plan sets a lot of policy and guides land use decision making. Um, so last master plan, I think, did have some recommendations to um, revise the central business district's um, design requirements to um, encourage uh, other types of housing, to encourage, you know, a more walkable, pedestrian-oriented, transit-oriented environment, um, and build on some of the, you know, walkable nature that that is Ferndale. It also had some recommendations about building materials and things like that as a lot of new projects and in 2016 were being planned. Uh, the Planning Commission Council community all saw some things that they said, hey, we would like to, to change to influence how new buildings are constructed and developed in Ferndale. Um, and so I think the, the 70 foot building height requirement, a lot of that actually predated this master plan. It probably, I think it was in the 2008 master plan and then the zoning ordinance updated in 2010. Some tweaks were made after that, but before this master plan. But anyway, um, you know, I think a lot of that was to encourage and um, aligned with, especially on Woodward, hopes for rapid transit. And so a lot of that thinking um, and intent was that to, there would be more demand for housing close to transit lines. And so there was a lot of encouragement of mixed use zoning, which uh, doesn't necessarily mean 70 foot tall buildings. It just means um, having some sort of ground level commercial or retail, and usually maybe some office mixed in, and then above that housing where people could live next to transit. Um, again, it was before the last master plan, um, so I can't speak on why 70 was chosen, but um, I think that's something that, you know, will certainly be part of this process, and I think, you know, Dave's comment is probably, you know, heard or, you know, felt by a lot of people, and, you know, what is the appropriate building height? So that's something that, as this master plan is built, you know, whatever that adopted plan plan is built by the community can say, you know, we think that actually this is more appropriate. Um, what is the scale and how are we deciding how buildings are felt? And that could lead to future zoning ordinance changes. So um, it is really a good time to, you know, give that sort of feedback. Um, I can pause there before I get into the R3 stuff, if, if, if you'd like. Um, yeah, why don't you pause just um, for a second? I, I see that we've got two more people who jumped on, so I'll give them a second to get the lay of the land. Um, we've sort of spent the first half hour um, just giving a very, very broad overview of you know what the Ferndale strategic plan is, what the master land use plan is, and the associated documents like uh, the parks and rec plan and the soon to be climate action plan, where to find them. Um, we're really just sort of having an informal discussion now. Folks have chimed on and um, introduced themselves. We're starting to get into some uh, questions and discussion. Um, so with that, I do wanna give Annie and Lena a moment to just introduce themselves, say hello, uh, chime in with any you know, reason why you decided to log on today, and then we'll circle back to uh, residential zoning. Hi, this is Ann Galligan. Are you going to post uh, the master plan anywhere so we can look at it? I'm sorry I was late. For That's meeting. okay. Yeah, no, if you go, um, the easiest way to describe how to get to it is go to planferndale.com. Um, and if you scroll down just a little bit, there's a link um, to the 2017 uh, master land use plan. Um, and that is the document that uh, we're, the city is really just kind of kicking off the revision process. So there are some public engagement opportunities coming up um, where we'll be soliciting specific 
feedback and ideas on what types of land use, what types of parks and rec, what kind of climate action priorities um, we should be aiming for moving forward. Lena, do you want to jump in and introduce yourself and say something about why you sure. joined us today? Yeah. Um, well, hi, thank you for the opportunity. My name is Lena. I'm the executive director of the Downtown Development Authority. Um, and the reason I'm joining at 740 is kiddos and bedtime. But <laughs> the, the overall reason that I wanted to be here is, you know, obviously I support processes like the Master Land Youth Plan and anything that lets us kind of zoom out and take a look at what we're doing and how we could be doing things better. But also I'm really interested in this, um, this format of kind of these more, um, I don't know, I don't want to call it unofficial. It's certainly not unofficial when you have the city manager and, you know, all sorts of staff here, but um, I like this potential, you know, for dialogue. So I'm really here just to kind of listen and hear what people have to say and also just check out this format because I really like it. Well, thanks for joining us. Yeah. All right, Justin, we were chatting a little bit about um, downtown zoning and um, I think you were about to start telling us about residential zoning, you know, what does R1, R2, R3 and whatever other codes get used, what do those mean? Exactly, yes. And so we're, we're also trying to um, stop using is, is so many, um, you know, acronyms and stuff, because it is, you know, it is almost like a different language. So yeah. I think that's one aspect of this master plan where if, uh, if I have a preference that we can, you know, try and make the zoning ordinance a little bit more friendly for everyone to use. So, uh, but this is a, if you can see my screen, this is a picture, or excuse me, this is the city's online zoning map application. And so it has the, some of the districts we were referencing. And so you can kind of see, um, where, where the current zoning is. Um, and a lot of it has frankly been in existence since 2010. But, um, you know, you can see that these um, abbreviations here um, align with the colors, right? And so a lot of the commercial type of districts, you know, are where you might expect with Woodward um, Nine Mile here. Um, there's some mixed use zoning that is, um, you know, further west on Nine Mile aligns with Livernoy and Hilton. Um, these two gray districts are industrial areas. And so that really sets laws um, about where these different uses can be built and what size the buildings are and where they're located. Um, and so um, the question was about R3 and just, um, I think just, you know, some concern from the community on what can be built there and what uses are there. And so the R3 district is interesting. And so I think if you look at a lot of communities in Michigan, um, you kind of see the more intense zoning districts um, where there are bigger buildings or uh, more density or more, more housing uh, or multiple family housing is sort of surrounded by their uh, commercial districts and then things kind of fan out from there. So um, these are sort of in order in that you know, R1 is a single family zoning district um, which is what the majority of the city is zoned. Um, and really that, you know, unless there's an existing um, duplex or something like that, it really is just for single family detached homes, which is the majority of land use in Ferndale. Um, R2 is sort of the next step up where it does for allow for two family buildings to be constructed uh, as well as single family detached homes. Um, and some, some townhomes uh, are there allowed there as well. Um, so R3 builds up and allows, um, you know, all three of those types of um, housing types. So detached single family homes, townhomes, two family buildings, and then multiple family buildings, you know, apartment buildings essentially. So that is where you see more of the dense uh, buildings. There's a, I think, right close to Withington Street, there's a, an existing building um, that I forget how many units it's in, but you, you'll see a few of them sort of along Withington Street, some on um, Vester and Breckenridge. Um, and, you know, I, I assume that, you know, in most communities that is, they allow density near uh, commercial areas where um, more people can walk to and from downtown or to and from transit and, and that sort of thing. But 
Um, there have been, I would say, a lot more multiple family projects built in the city since um, right before the last master plan and into present. Um, and so I would say that there weren't a ton of like zoning changes with our three um, in this last master plan, but there were was certainly a more interest in Ferndale. And then I would say just across Metro Detroit to build more multiple family residential um, housing. And so I think, you know, you're seeing that was, or that came to, to fruition um, with a project like 244 Vester. Um, and there's been others that have been proposed on Whittington Street and other areas that haven't really been built, but, um, but definitely much more interest related to that. Um, so I don't know if that was ex exactly the question, but um, I think that the last master plan did say, hey, if we're gonna be a more um, inclusive community and offer different housing types to people that may not be able to afford a, a single family detached home or, or something like that, um, we need to allow um, for multiple family housing. Um, and so there were some, I think, changes related to um, building materials and stuff like that that were in the last master plan. Um, and, so I think, you know, a lot of those developments came to fruition. Some, some things definitely, you know, um, at planning commission meetings. So just so you all know, I'm this main staff person at planning commission meetings. So the planning commission is a volunteer board um, that reviews most of the site plans and new developments to come to the city. So they saw a lot of multiple family um, projects over the past five to six years. Um, and, you know, definitely, I think, made some zoning ordinance changes related to design um, and, and building height and, and, and requiring um, private open area or part front porches and uh, bicycle parking and electric vehicle charging stations and stuff like that um, as a result of the master plan, but also re reacting to, um, you know, design challenges, I think that some of those early projects had. So I'd say it's still a work in progress. And I think that is design is something that we think is very much um, I hope that the community, you know, provides feedback on, um, because I think there are ways to, you know, design um, other housing types that fit within um, the city. And I think, you know, even on Withington Street, there's three buildings I can think of that are multiple family, but they don't necessarily look that way because when they were designed in the 20s and 30s, they, they fit into the neighborhood very well using brick materials and um, they provide trees and things like that. So I think there's a balance. And I think that, you know, that's one way that I hope the community gives feedback on and we can, um, you know, help evolve what the next phase of housing is um, in Ferndale. So um, you prompted me to think of a, a couple of things. Planning is uh, not at all my background, um, but I've been making an effort to learn an awful lot about it in the last couple of years. And one thing that I've noticed is that some, um, some folks are moving away from the term um, single family uh, zoning and using words like um, single unit detached um, because I guess sort of the concept of single family or multiple family is getting sort of antiquated as, as the definition of family is, is evolving and, and how people choose to um, cohabitate is evolving or to not cohabitate. Um, our, our census records are showing that um, in Ferndale, there are less and less people uh, living in a single unit. Um, there's often two or one in a single unit. Um, so I just sort of wanted to throw that out as, as food for thought. Um, the other thing that I'm learning a little bit about is that um, certainly um, it, 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 I would imagine um, at Ferndale's um, early history, as in many places across the country, um, there was not much regulation in residential zoning, um, and a lot of that popped up sort of post-war, um, frankly, as a response to um, no longer being able to use restrictive covenants and other sort of facially um, racist housing policies. Um, zoning was sort of the new tool um, 
that that was used to to really limit the options for um, for people of color, um, which is something that I'm trying to be mindful of as we have these discussions. Um, so I just wanted to point chime in with that as we're as we're talking about these issues. Absolutely. I mean, important to point out, I think anyone who would Google, you know, uh, redlining maps of Metro Detroit, you would you would see redlining was a, um, you know, a, a racist tactic by insurance companies and others associated with housing that, you know, kind of separated where um, d different people could live uh, based on race. And it's it's awful. And you see that built in in um, a lot of zoning code that just says we're only going to allow single family housing because we know that other certain people can't afford it. And, mm -hmm. and so that's something that I think that, you know, with council's anti-racism policy that was passed and things like that, I mean, we're, we would very much want to look at the zoning ordinance and say, you know, what, what were the intentions of this and, and how should we make, you know, this zoning ordinance more equitable so more people, um, different types of people with different incomes can live in Ferndale. Exactly. Um, is there anyone, let's see, I think Sharon looks like a new name that has popped up. Sharon, other folks have introduced themselves and said a little bit about what prompted them to log on or if you have any specific questions, um, you are fear, just feel free to chime in. I'm Sharon Chess and I'm oh, chiming hi. in. I apologize for being so late, but I'm coming from another meeting down in Detroit. Um, and so I missed like all of the identifying um, ledger that a legend that you had identifying the spaces, but I get them. And answering to your question, Kat, in regards to referencing single unit detached mm -hmm. um, places to live back in the day, and it's been quite some time now when you saw condo cities going up all over surrounding communities, Canton, Westland, um, even Royal Oak kind of thing. And um, even going further north, what I understood to be happening with these single unit detached condos is it was a quicker way for builders to build. And um, because of permitting processes, mm -hmm. um, licensing and taxes as well. So it wasn't necessarily put in uh, context of how to identify um, families necessarily, but it mm. was met as a building term in order to get more faster. Um, and I believe that still applies to, you know, to this day. Um, okay. What I've noticed around Ferndale um, because I drive around our streets all the time because there's always something going on with building and building builders are coming up with all kinds of unique ideas on how to make a livable space. And I actually like all of the container homes that are going up. Um, they're fascinating to watch go in, but yeah. I also believe that they're not necessarily putting in spaces that um, that fit into existing neighborhoods. For instance, the one that's currently going up on Camborne and Bermuda mm -hmm. on the corner there. Um, I just find that an odd spot to put up a container home. Um, and the one that went up over on, I think it's Bermuda or over in the very first one, the big one that sold for over $400,000 when the other homes are valued at like sixty and $70,000. Um, so I think there's a time and a place and. I absolutely love the concept of the container homes and the tiny homes and stuff. And I'd like to find an area in the community where that's just specific to that style of home because the tiny homes and the container homes, in my opinion, are more affordable, although trendy um, places to live. And people, you know, they're living in a trendy neighborhood for an affordable space. So I've always wondered since we started allowing these container builds go in, um, if we could have a designated area for such development instead of putting them sporadically around town and in neighborhoods where they just really don't fit. 
um, but they're cool to look at and cool to watch build. Over in Royal Oak, they were the first ones to create a small little area. I forget how many acres it is, um, but all of the homes in that area are container homes. They're also going for four and five and six hundred thousand dollars. But it depends on who you get to develop those homes and the purpose for developing those homes. Um, just out of curiosity, Sharon, I'm, I'm I'm just trying to flesh out your your um, concern a little bit. Is it is it more about the the size and the pricing, or more about the aesthetic, or both? It's it's both actually, Cat, because I I like cool and I like old. That's why we live in Ferndale. Um, it's it's a mix of everything, but the container homes and the tiny homes, and I don't know that we've got one, a tiny home yet built in Ferndale. Um, I know there were a couple of people that were looking to build a tiny home and for whatever reason, it never came to fruition. Um, but I know that even though the builders who are making these container homes are charging an arm and a leg for them when, when the cost is really a lot less than brick and mortar, um, and it just seems if we're looking to affordable housing, like there's no reason for somebody to live in an affordable housing area that's a track home, uh, basically, like I grew up in back in the 50s, okay? Every, every home looked the same, all three bedroom ranch style homes. They were affordable living for first families. Um, and um, we need more of those style homes, but we need them with a little bit more style. So they don't look like they're affordable housing. So let me ask a quick question of Justin and then um, Lindsay raised her hand and we'll, we'll have her chime in next. Um, Justin, I saw somewhere recently, um, I, think, I think whatever I saw, they were called uh, cottage clusters where um, you know, on a, a single parcel or maybe two parcels, there would be, um, detached, but small and close together um, units um, around a courtyard or something like that. It is, is there such a place in Ferndale where I, I don't know of any that exist currently, but is, is that a possibility of something that could occur in Ferndale under our current um, zoning and um, framework? I think it would be tough for most sites in Ferndale. Someone did propose one, um, the, a cottage court, um, and it, lo it looked pretty sharp, I would say, at least from the designs, but it didn't end up moving forward, but it was on a very large parcel where you could do mm -hmm. that. Um, so our current zoning ordinance does have some limitations on spacing between buildings, and mm -hmm. um, it doesn't have a, a, a um, lot coverage min minimum, which some communities do have, which kind of like forces you to build sort of a Bigfoot type of home. Um, but it does have a uh, lot coverage mac maximum as well. So um, so it would be tough to build a cottage court unless you had a very large parcel, just because I think, I want to say the average um, lot width in the city is somewhere around 35 feet. Um, so there's a lot of narrow lots, especially, um, you know, it, close to Woodward and close to downtown. So, but the the apartment that was built across the street from me they ended up purchasing two lots and combining mm -hmm. them for the for the apartment building would that be possible um potentially, under zoning yeah potentially yeah um you, you would need a decent number of parcels i think and so i think what what i've seen mostly as well um in conversations with developers and builders is that for them to acquire two parcels, usually they try and fit, you know, as many units as they can vertically within the zoning. Um, and so, so that's why that one big parcel would have, could have made sense to do a cottage court, but probably two or three parcels together, it would be um, probably not as efficient for them. But I think so, it's definitely like that cottage court type of style. There's a lot of, I mean, housing types, if you look in our, in our ordinance, there's a definition of dwellings. It really only allows for, you know, five or six variations. So um, I think what I've seen in other communities is to allow for other, to kind of loosen the, the different types of housing 
and um, where they're located. And that does help with affordability and that does help with, um, you know, different types of architecture that can still be compatible. So um, I think that's definitely something that I've heard from a lot of people. So I, I think one aspect of this whole master plan process with design and architecture, I'm not an architect, um, but a lot of people have different opinions about architecture. And so I'm always interested to hear those conversations. And I think we do actually have a lot of architects that live in Ferndale and planners and stuff, but um, an it's always was an architect. <laughs> yeah. Right. And so I think it's just, it's kind of cool to see everyone's different opinions. And I don't know, to me, like a lot of Ferndale, it is kind of like what Sharon said, a lot of different housing types, um, but there probably could be some better quality in, some, you know, um, in the design and building and, material. And just as a reminder, um, you know, we're, we're kicking off the land use revision process. So there are going to be public engagement um, uh, opportunities um, in October and again early next year and um, probably other opportunities scattered throughout um, to give input on both um, zoning density as well as um, aesthetics and materials. So um, so this conversation is is a very initial scratching of the surface. We've got lots of opportunities to engage. Um, Lindsay, you've had your hand up for a minute. Why don't you chime in? Yeah, thanks, Kat. I appreciate you bringing up some of the like racialized history of land use in Ferndale and everybody speaking to, you know, the city's commitment to anti-racism. And I'm just curious if any of you could speak to how you plan to incorporate kind of that like racial equity lens into this process um, or if that has yet to be defined. I think yet to be defined, but I think what I would say is that, um, you know, we're looking to invite anyone that's interested, obviously, to the community summit meetings that we're having, but also, you know, meeting intentionally with with different groups. Um, I, there are some groups that I didn't, didn't even know existed in Ferndale. Um, I think someone mentioned the other day the um, Ferndale Public Schools has an African-American um, uh, parent, network. PC, parent network that I, you know, I think they would be very important to talk to. So I think it's it's really about uh, being intentional about who we're talking to and listening and, and, and you know having that lens on what do the policies say right now and, and what are their downfalls when it comes to to anti-racism. So uh, I would say more to come on that. I know that's pretty vague, but I would say on the project page, there's a lot of opportunities for for people to reach out to staff to set up those types of meetings. And so we're that's I think what I'm looking forward to. Uh, Aside from the design conversation, just just getting to know and talking to all the different people that maybe didn't participate last time or are new to Ferndale even. Yeah, and I'll, I'll chime in also and say that, um, you know, I, I wear a number of, of hats, um, city council member, you know, longtime resident, former steering committee member, um, and Ferndale Inclusion Network member. Um, so I know, you know, Lindsay and I work together on, on Finn and Finn's hoping to host some sessions um, in the near future to talk about some of these issues to help provide some education to the community so that we're all a little bit better informed and better prepared to participate in this process, you know, having some of that foundational um, understanding. Um, and it was also a point of discussion at the joint uh, meeting between the planning commission and and city council. So, um, you know, one of my personal um, objectives is just to to make sure that we're not ignoring these issues and that we're raising them and talking about them and, and tackling them. But it doesn't end with that. I would also add, um, just as a, a point of education, from council's resolution, we've um, since then joined a, a national network uh, called Governments Advocating for Racial Equity or GARE. And through GARE, we've been getting counseled on developing an internal racial equity action team. And that team, members of that team 
is uh, formalized and working out. I actually met this morning, but members of that team did have a review of the RFP. So we were intentional about incorporating an equity lens into the actual uh, bid requirements for the contractor who actually ultimately won the bid largely because of their uh, responses to how they would uh, incorporate equity into their engagement process and their documentation process. And I must plug also um, October 12th in, in Ferndale City Hall, and this will be uh, a hybrid meeting as well, so you can watch online. This is advertised on the city's website right now, but we are holding uh, a community discussion on racial equity that's hosted by uh, the city's internal racial equity action team. So we have a, a facilitator who's going to be having a discussion with the community about that. And uh, not a, if we haven't already, Justin, I think that's a great opportunity to make sure we have the engagement information around the master land use plan for attendees of that meeting. Yeah, absolutely. And I should have pointed out earlier, so our um, partner who uh, Joe referenced um, was awarded the bid for this project to help assist city staff and the community with the plan, uh, Smith Group. Um, and, and Joe's absolutely right. We specifically picked them because of their experience and things they've done um, in the city of Detroit, the Glo Joe Lewis Greenway and other projects. And so um, even in a meeting that we held two weeks ago, I think that they um, you know, showed their strength in that regard and, and really do want to help us. Uh, and they bring a different lens, you know, outside of, of the city. So um, I think that will be helpful for the process and getting people involved. Sharon, I see your hand up and I'm also going to make one more pitch. Um, Dominic hasn't chimed in yet. I don't know. I don't know if he uh, is just listening or uh, doesn't have a microphone connected to his account. Um, but I hope you'll chime in, Dominic, if you're able to. Uh, go ahead, Sharon. I have a question in regards to the parcel that's at the corner of Pinecrest and Eight Mile. Did you already have a conversation about that in the beginning of your meeting? Um, not specifically, nope. My question to you is what was it four or five years ago when a developer came in and really had an idea for a neighborhood build there? that particular project in the way <clears throat> and the the development itself i was not an advocate for but it didn't mean that i wasn't an advocate for developing that property for housing where do we stand in that particular parcel good question <laughs> uh and sharon i don't know if you picked it up but that was um that was one of the, that was the project that was proposing a cottage court among other housing types on their project. But um, for those that aren't familiar at Eight Mile and Pinecrest, just south of the high school, there's a an old industrial site that um, you know does have a lot of trees on it, and um, you know it's sort of a, a lot, probably the largest parcel I guess in in Ferndale. Um, and initially, there was a proposal four years ago for, like I said, a number of housing types. Um, a daycare facility, um, a small, or not small, but a, a green space and a number of things. Um, it's also a, a brownfield site that needs a lot of cleanup on it as well. And so, you know, I think it's had a few owners um, over the years, but um, essentially my understanding is that um, Detroit Axle, which is an auto parts um, repurposing manufacturer in, in the city, they have an existing warehouse on Eight Mile, just adjacent to the site. They um, did acquire a portion of that site and did get a site plan approved a few years ago to have a second warehouse. Um, and I, my understanding is that I think that they're, you know, trying that they have acquired more pieces of that. Um, so I'm not sure how much and and what the future is, um, but that's been just more recent news. And I believe um, Detroit Axel did you know, meet with um, the neighborhood group over there. And so I guess we'll see what, what comes of, the, of that, but um, effectively that original proposal that how all of the different housing types um, won't be moving forward. Yeah, that it's unfortunate because it's a good space for that, but it was just the design there was that I had issue with sidewalks and busing and entering and exiting the neighborhood and stuff like that. And I was surprised to see that 
the developer virtually for whatever reason walked away and there was no other presentation or design presented after the initial um, presentation. So I just wondered, was the Brownfield project too big um, and too much of an investment for somebody to do something like that? Do you have a clue as to how much it would cost to clean that particular par parcel of land up? I don't personally. I know that um, you know the property owner has been working with um, Eagle um, um, through the state on um, cleaning up that site. It's it's you know known to the state, and they have a what's called a do care plan um, that requires certain cleanup activities at certain stages. So they're working with the state. So we do get updates from time to time, um, but um, I don't think they've started all the remediation activities, but I think it is a large site, like you said, and, and would be costly to do. But I think that at the, at least the planning commission meetings I was at for that previous proposal, um, I think the, the community, you know, said that it was probably too much and had some of the same issues you had uh, or had raised um, about that proposal. So um, we'll kind of see um, I think we've told anybody who, who comes to work on, on that parcel and, and really most others in the city is, you know, go talk to your neighbors and go talk to the community first and then come talk to us and we'll, you know, give you a process and of, of what your steps are and what the zoning ordinance says. So. Okay. And then like, if I have a moment to ask another question, what is before we Before we go off of that piece of property, I actually want to chime in on something. Um, and then we'll we'll pop back. Um, a comment and a question about that about that spot. Um, my comment, you probably already know what it is because I've I've griped about it for years. Um, but I've all, it's always troubled me that that particular piece of property has no sidewalk um, because so we have so many students that attend um, Ferndale High School and Ferndale Middle School who are walking from um, Royal Oak Township, um, you know, which are predominantly black students um, who have to cross Pinecrest twice or walk in the street or walk on the grass, you know, depending on the weather that may or may not be safe um, or a, a good route. Um, and so it's always bugged me <laughs> that there's no, uh, sidewalk on that piece of land. So that, that's my comment. Um, and my question is um, the piece of property that we're talking about, what, what is it zoned for um, such that if the property owner, owner wanted to do something with it, um, they would just be able to do it as a right without having to um, you know, request anything for approval from the city. I'm just curious. Sure. Uh, so first I would say, I agree with your comment um, about the sidewalk. It's a very frustrating situation. Um, the Ferndale, it was that, that area was also noted in the Ferndale Moves Mobility Plan as, hey, this needs a sidewalk here in the future. So um, so we're, we're in agreement on that. Um, the And what's sort of unfortunate um, with the past proposals is that they, at least the, the housing proposal they would have built, they would have been required to build, but they were going a little bit above and beyond and did sort of like a shared use walking, biking path along Pinecrest that would have been, uh, you know, a helpful connection, but there are trade-offs with, with every project proposed, right? Um, so um, the property is zoned M1 limited industrial, which allows for everything from warehouse to, you know, a, like production facility, like a, let's just say like a t-shirt printing shop that has like a certain square foot of retail. Um, there's a medical office that's permitted there. Um, and really any new type of structure that has those types of uses would have to submit a site plan and go through, be reviewed by a staff in the planning commission. So no matter what, um, that's when, you know, we'd look, look at a site plan and they'd be required to do landscape improvements, uh, tree replacements, um, parking requirements, and that sidewalk would would be part of a future development. So okay. um, I mentioned that Detroit Axle had a plan approved on a portion of that site a couple of years ago. Um, they were required to build
build a sidewalk. If that project comes to fruition, they would have to build a sidewalk. There, that portion was going to be an eight mile. It didn't really touch Pinecrest, but um, so that's when that type of would thing the could city be have the right to just install a, a sidewalk and send them the bill for it, or is that not how that works? Um, I think there, uh, that's a little bit out of my depth, but I think you'd there, if there was like a sidewalk improvement district or something, then that's probably when that they would happen. have to, uh, pardon, they'd have to agree to participate in a special assessment district and essentially tax themselves and the city would then install it and seek reimbursement through the tax roll. Okay. I, I want to be mindful of our time. We're, um, a little bit after eight o'clock, we're definitely going to end at 8.30, because um, I don't want to hold staff hostage indefinitely. Um, I know Sharon, you had another question and Dave has his hand raised. Is there anyone who has not had a chance to chime in yet who would like to ask a question or chime in on something? Um, and if not, we'll, we'll go back to Sharon and Dave. All right, Sharon, what's the next part of your question or concern. Um, what is the park that's on eight mile where all the condos or multifamily units were built? Oh, um, Garbett Park, is that what? Is that it? Okay, Garbett Park off of Farmdale and what is that, Fielding or Marshall or something. Is there an opportunity, to, even though I really don't like taking park space, what about Harding Park? Is that the same, it's a, it appears to be similar in size off of 10 mile. Um, it's elongated, but narrow and stuff. Is there any space there that could be um, transformed like they did in Garbutt Park there off of eight mile in Farmdale? Oh, I, I think what you're referring to and, and Justin and Joe, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I, I don't think that any portion of Garbutt Park, Park itself was actually redeveloped. I think it was adjacent school property that used to be Taft School. Um, so I don't believe there was any city spa park space that, that was redeveloped. It was- So something. that was all from like the old university yeah. um, school. Um, yeah, um, the old Taft School, yeah. In uh, 2014, the school district consolidated Correct. And then they disposed of uh, two properties. That was one property. Okay. But Gar Garbutt Park was not redeveloped. That that boundary is, is sustained. Okay. All right. Well, they were they were adjacent in such a way that I could see where it might not have been clear. Okay. I appreciate that. Then. Dave. Hi. About probably three different ideas. Uh, one regarding the uh, Eight and Pinecrest area, um, Mike there at uh, Detroit Axel was, uh, the contamination issues were mainly was stopping him from developing the M1 area right on Eight Mile and also the, uh, the previous owner, developer, Pinecrest Holdings LLC sold to Mike as Detroit you know, at to Detroit Axle um, number two LLC, so it's you know Mike is yeah um, has all three basically properties the eight mile the forest and the meadow area, and um, and that's just how it's standing. It's you know the, um, he's mainly interested in developing maybe eventually the the eight mile area as far as warehouse uh, for his business he um, actually had moved out most of his business to uh, oh into Detroit the old um, I'm forgetting the auto planet um, but yeah in the eight mile area is, is basically a, just a retail front right now yeah. and then um, regarding the zoning I believe that most people, like on Leroy, West Saratoga, West Troy, really like their neighborhood as is, which is basically R1. And as I've always seen with developers, if anything is developed, is zoned as R3, uh, they'll 
and can allow R1 or R2, they'll go for the maximum development as they possibly can and increase the density. So people who have lived in a house that uh, takes care of a, a family very well, uh, or you know, even grandma and you know mom and dad and the kids, that will they'll start feeling like they're being submerged by R3 four-story buildings until they can't stand it and move out, which I've known a number of people from West Saratoga say, I can't stand this place. And one person I'm with him been saying, I don't want to live next to a seven-story building. And did ask me, uh, the Planning Commission, how do I change my zoning in Withington from R3 um, back to R1? And um, the Planning Commission did, said there would be, be a lot of work for them, and they really weren't interested in doing it. And we did attend that meeting. And so um, we can, with the R3, we can get very maximum development that people really don't want. Okay. Probably the fourth issue is really the city of Ferndale, which I did bring up at a city council meeting, I think. It was like, yeah, it was developed, I think it was called like the Cincinnati Methodist, uh, several different economic areas. You know, northwest is upper middle class, southwest more middle class, and east side was working class. It was a distributed area. and. Um, and I think a lot of the pricing unaffordability is mainly developed by, um, to me, land speculators, uh, which are doing the same thing that they did to other low-income people, just making houses un unaffordable and controlling the prices. So those are my several I items. <laughs> Dave, um, if you don't mind, you have um, a fair amount of background noise. If you don't mind oh, yeah, waiting. I will. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, well, again, we're about five minutes away from my 830 hard stop. Um, so I want to make sure that anyone else who hasn't had a chance to chime in or ask a question, uh, make a comment, um, gets that opportunity to do so. You can raise your hand if you want, or you can just unmute and chime in. Aunt Annie, I saw you. Oh, I just had a quick question. I came in late, but there's a lot of good information to go through, like quite a lot of pages. Yeah. So if anybody has a question, who is kind of like the lead on this project that we should contact directly? Annie, you can contact me, Justin Lyons, planning manager for the city. Um, okay. Happy to chat. Okay. That's a really good um, sort of place to end at, Justin. What, what are the best ways that folks can get involved um, to do some background homework to prepare themselves to participate in this process? And, you know, what can they do to make sure that they are notified of the next steps in the process? Sure. If, if people can bear with me one more time while I share my screen, um, I think we've definitely hit our bingo allotment for uh, saying that phrase. But in any case, so this is if you go to planforndale.com or the link that was provided in Zoom, this is the, the project page. And so, you know, we tried to simplify because um, there wasn't even a lot more information here. But in any case, um, we have this whole section here about how to get involved. And so the email list is definitely, I think, um, a great spot to, to keep informed. And so we're working on the first like real big update to that. Um, there will be a, like a discussion board that we'll have here um, that will post some questions and that'll be a good way to get some feedback. Um, we are setting up small group discussions. So if you, you know, have a neighborhood group or just, you know, four neighbors or something like that, that want to just, you know, have a meeting and, you know, we can um, set something like that up um, where we can either give you materials and, you know, fill them out and give us feedback, or we can attend the meeting too as well. Um, so we're trying to figure that out. I haven't got any requests yet. So I'm, I'm waiting for our first. Um, We'll be doing some online surveys as well, but this page really does have um, the upcoming events, 
Um, there's some past events where you could take a look at the presentation that was done um, at the Council and Planning Commission meeting a couple of weeks ago. But there's a lot of ways to just request information here. But I think it also is important. Um, and it, as I said, 117 action items, I think it's 170 pages. The previous plan is pretty long, um, but I think it's you know helpful background. And so I think the other thing we're doing is trying to summarize a little bit lower here some of the things that have happened since the last parks and uh, master plan. But again, I'm the planning manager kind of, you know, shepherding this project um, over the next probably six to eight months, maybe. Um, and so, you know, you can always just contact me if you have a question or just want to send a, um, a quick comment. That's fine, too. So what's your email address, Justin? So it's J Lyons. It's J L Y O N S at ferndalemi.gov, or uh, you can also reach me at 248-336-4370. Um, and we have others on the team that'll be helping out with the project too. But um, so if you don't hear back from me, you'll hear back from another person on the team, so. And Annie posted in the chat, she said, can you post a public blog? Um, Annie, since you've got the planning director <laughs> and I think the, Communications director might still be on. She might have had to go. Yeah, you were talking um, about maybe doing something where you could, that way, if somebody has a blog, there would be like somebody could ask a question, there would be an answer. So you don't have to repeat yourself a million times on email. Oh, well, there is an FAQ section on the page. So I think, I think that raises a good point that, you know, as we get more feedback and more questions, you know, if we get the same thing twice, maybe that's a clue to add that. To, to the page, the, the planferndale.com page. Absolutely. And it's not quite live yet, but there will be this sort of discussion board where um, I think that'll be, that'll probably achieve part of what, um, Annie, that you're, you're thinking as well. So um, more to come on that. But but yeah, I, I think that rather than me answer the same question over and over, that's a smart idea. I appreciate it. Yeah. All right. Well, we met our goal of ending at 8.30. It's 8.30 right now. I really appreciate um, all of the city staff who um, spent yet another evening um, working to make the, the city better and inform residents um, and have engaged in this conversation. I think all of the residents and interested folks who um, participated and listened and asked questions and um, engaged in what to me was a really um, informative and enjoyable conversation. Thank you so much for coming. Good night.